so we are in week six, right? Week six, yeah. So uh, I have posted on Elite uh, the date for the mid semester exam, which will be held on the 3rd May, uh, which is going to be next month, the first Monday of next month. So uh, the exam will cover LU1 and LU2. So we are now in LU2. LU1 we have covered in the first, in the second week. Uh, LU2 we are still on it. Uh, perhaps uh, we will finish it by next week, uh, next Monday. So that will be all the things that will be covered in mid semester exam. Okay. Uh, the platform is Elite Exam, so uh, further information or announcement will be posted later from time to time. Yeah. Um, so just to let you know also, uh, for Tutorial 2, uh, you can start doing it because some of the questions are those uh, tests that we have covered before. Yeah. So you see the deadline is 27, so the reason why I put it on the 27 because I I hope that I can give some feedbacks once I receive the assignment from uh, the tutorials from you on the 27. I try to mark it and return it before the exam, before the mid semester exam. So that's why I put it on the 27. Yeah. Uh, so if I put after 3rd May, then you cannot get, you know, you cannot benefit what uh, the feedback will be. So please um, go through the tutorials. Uh, the tutorial covers uh, all the questions of the test that we have covered, like one sign test, uh, sign test, sorry, sign test, and then um, we'll constant sign rank test, man with me rank test. So those tests we have discussed, right? So you can start doing the tutorial so that we don't you don't spend too much time uh, at the very last minute later. Okay, so once we cover. Um, Today's text and uh, the next one is treatment test, the last topic in LU2. Then you just do that part for uh, for your tutorial. So you don't have to spend, you have, I mean, you have finished all the earlier parts. Okay. So please do so. It's, it's a part of your revision also for the mid semester exam. Yeah. So please um, participate in the group discussion. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be in a group, right? The task. So, right, so yeah, please um, proceed yeah, with tutorial two, even though we have not yet finished adding two. You can start doing all the question one to three, I guess. Okay, so today we are going to cover uh, another test in LU2. Before that, everything is clear. My voice? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay. okay, thanks. Um, so just to recap what we have uh, gone through for the past few weeks, yeah, just to, yeah, to, to know or to, uh, yeah, to recap where you are now. Uh, in LU2, we talk about non-parametric tests, right? So there are several tests and we have covered some of them. And we are going to cover another one today and another one next week. Uh, if uh, if I can make it like, if I can record the, the last topic, the last lecture, I will record it inshallah, um, so that you can uh, you can have a look at the topic earlier than next Monday. Okay, but I'll try my best. If not, then we can we, we just discuss on the next lecture or next Monday. Okay. Uh, so first, the first test that we have uh, discussed under LB2 is sign test. Right. Uh, what is sign test? The principle is to just um, concern with the sign of uh, the data. Okay. Again, uh, in statistics, uh, we are concerned with the comparison of the samples, comparison of the data set. So each sample has its own data, whereby we want to compare the data inside that particular sample with another sample. OK, so uh, it's, it's very important for you to have a, a clear understanding why uh, what is actually um, the main business in statistics. We are comparing, we are analyzing, analyzing by comparing the samples. OK, 
I hope that's clear. And uh, what differentiates one test uh, from another, uh, one test to another, is um, the type of the data. Yeah. So the, the data has uh, different different uh, features. Okay. Uh, but in LU2, we are talking about non-parametric data. So uh, you have to be clear what is non-parametric data. So as I said, non-parametric data are data that are ordinal. It can be um, of different situations. Ordinal, ordinal means according to the order, right? What, how you want to uh, visualize it? It's like uh, when you give ratings, when you give uh, ranks. Yeah? For example, if you are satisfied with any service, you can rate it as 10 or 9 or 10. 10 is the maximum. Zero is the lowest, right? So from 10, from zero to 10, that is the max. Yeah? So that sort of data, like how many people voted for uh, one mark, how many people voted for two, three, and so on, until 10 marks. That data is considered as non parametric data because the data is based on the order. Okay, that is ordinal data. Uh, another type of uh, non parametric data is nominal data. Nominal data is, let's say, you want to ask for a survey what is the color of uh, your hair, for example? Yeah? So it has different characteristics, right? The, the color of the hair, like white, brown, gray. Yeah. So that characteristics is a unique from each other. Red, for example, red is not the same as black. So that sort of data uh, is called nominal data. Nominal data. Yeah? Uh, and another situation where the data is considered as non-parametric is when the sample size is small. The size of the sample is small. Uh, it's mean, it means that the sample only has five, uh, uh, less than 25. The, the definition is less than 25. That is considered small and is considered as non-parametric data. So for example, if the sample has only 12, yeah, which is less than 25, and another sample has um, maybe uh, 10, which is also less than 25. So that two set of data is considered as non-parametric data. So that's why, and in order for you to analyze the two samples, you have to use non-parametric tests. But if let's say you have two samples and each of them has more than 25, yeah, let's say sample one has 50, sample two has 60, yeah, which is um, both of them are more than 25. So those data are parametric data. Yeah? And how to analyze them, how to compare the two samples, you cannot use non-parametric tests. You have to use parametric tests, which we will cover in LU3. So this is just to uh, revise uh, what is non-parametric data and uh, the type of data that are to be tested using non-parametric tests, which are covered in this LU2, okay? So that you are clear why you are using, what is the difference later if you study um, LU3 later, so you should know why, uh, what kind of data are considered as non-parametric and what kind of data are considered as parametric, okay? And under non-parametric, and even under either one, a non-parametric or parametric, uh, there are another way how to visualize it, how to visualize the samples. Okay, so when we cover sign tests, yeah, sign test and also uh, will constant sign rank test, that's the first uh, two tests that we cover under this LU. Uh, these two tests are designed for analyzing uh, samples that are dependent. Okay, so uh, when we talk about samples, we can divide it into uh, dependent and independent. Okay, what is meant by dependent samples? Uh, normally, we are talking about two samples, dependent. Yeah? Dependent means it depends on each other. Or in other words, there is an association between the two samples. So that kind of samples are to be analyzed using sign test or Wilkinson sign rank test. But now, what's the difference between sign test and Wilkinson sign rank test? Sign test is the simplest test. 
it only uh, it only concerns with the sign. That is not that really like it is simple, but it's not that really uh, it doesn't give a uh, much picture about the comparison because it just consider the plus and the minus. But we concern sign run test is more detailed, is more advanced than the sign test. But both of the tests are designed for analyzing dependent samples. So examples of dependent samples are, uh, let's say, in a situation where we want to compare uh, before and after situation, right? Let's say you give a treatment or you give a, maybe a course to a, a sample of students and you want to compare the performance before the treatment is given or before the course is given, right? And after. So that is, you know, that, that kind of things are dependent. Yeah, you cannot just analyze uh, one sample before. You have to compare with something, isn't it? So that are examples of uh, uh, dependent samples. Okay. Right. And also, if let's say, yeah, I think that's that's the thing before and after. And if you want to test the same sample but with different situations, or maybe not just before and after, but different, maybe different. Uh, nutrients or different um, maybe supplement, yeah, but uh, still referring to the same sample, uh, and that is also considered as dependent samples because you want to compare, let's say, between supplement A and supplement B. Uh, what is the maybe the glucose level, for example? Uh, so you need to compare the two things. Yes, I mean you, you need to see how uh, supplement A varies with supplement B and. Those are examples of dependent samples. Okay, right. So last week we talked about Man Whitney rank sum test. So this is another test, and why it is created? Uh, it is uh, designed for analyzing uh, independent samples, two independent samples. So we are still talking about two samples from sign test until Man Whitney rank sum test. Two samples, but it's just that the type of the samples are different. So for my, uh, for Ben Whitney rank some tests, uh, the samples are independent. Yeah, independent means you are analyzing one sample that is not associated. It's not about uh, before and after things. Okay, so it's about uh, just like random situation. Okay, maybe like uh, student uh, students from uh, University A, students from University B, but they are not actually associated. There is no association. So that are called independent samples. Yeah. Uh, and if let's say we want to analyze the two independent samples, we need man with me rank some tests. So the test it is designed for analyzing independent, two independent samples. Okay. So take note on the two. We are still about uh, comparing two samples. Okay. So today's lecture, we'll move to uh, Another test, another non parametric test called Kraskal Wallis test. Okay, Kraskal Wallis test. So, how this test is different from Man Whitney test? So, Man Whitney test, we are just analyzing two independent samples. But if what happened if, let's say, we have more than two, let's say in your experiment, you have three samples, which, which is more than two, right? Th three independent samples, and they are uh, non parametric data. Let's say the number of the size of the sample is small. Maybe you want to talk about uh, samples of bacteria from um, lake A, lake B, and lake C, but your number, uh, your yeah, sample size is less than 25, so it's parametric, non parametric data. And the number of samples is no longer two, it's like three. So you cannot no, uh, no longer use man Whitney tests, but you have to move to Another test, and uh, the test that is designed to capture more than two independent samples is uh, Kraskal Wallis test. Okay, two independent samples of non parametric data. So it's very important to emphasize on the non parametric data. Okay, so Kraskal Wallis test, um, uh, in short, it is designed to analyze more than two independent samples. So in this lecture, we are going to look at uh, what is Kraskal-Wallis test, uh, how to use it, 
and the steps in the Glasgow Wallis test. Okay. Before that, I have uploaded uh, the lecture notes and also the tables on Healy. Okay, so we gonna have a look at our new tables. Yeah, so every test it has its own uh, tables. Tables for for us to find uh, the values needed. Okay, so you should remember this table is for which test. Okay, so in this lecture, we are going to have a look at. Uh, Two more tables, eh? okay, so make sure that you take note on the tables that I've uploaded. Okay, so let's have a look at the introduction. Okay, so as I said just now, uh, Crosco Wallis test is a non parametric test used to deal with three or more random independent samples. So this keyword is very important. Independent, it should be independent. Uh, and also more than two, two and above, uh, three and above, yeah? three or more. So it's not just three, it can be three, it can be four, it can be five, yeah? as long as it is more than two. Okay, uh, so that is the difference between uh, Quasco Wallis and Man Whitman tests. Okay, uh, if let's say we want to compare with uh, parametric data, okay, parametric data. Uh, this test is equivalent to one way and over. Uh, have you heard about this test before? Maybe you have studied in SPM or matriculation, maybe? Have you heard about ANOVA? Unfortunately not. No, okay. Uh, okay, so we will cover this ANOVA in LU3, okay? But this is just for you to know. Um, yeah. So this is a, an equivalent to one way ANOVA for uh, parametric data. Okay, but you don't have to worry about it. Just just know about it. Eh? Uh, later we will study about one way ANOVA and you can compare with the test. Okay. So when K is the number of samples, okay, this one K is the number of samples. Yeah. So obviously in this test, the number of samples should be three at least three yeah three four and above yeah more than two uh but when the k is two the test produces the same results as the man Whitney test so meaning to say that actually if it is the same as man Whitney, just uh when the k is two yeah but uh to say that the principles is the same as man Whitney, but it's just that uh now it uh considers more samples and the k is no longer two okay but that's why you say that uh, later you can see some of the steps is the same, uh, especially um, in terms of the ranking determination. Okay, so that's some introduction about uh, Frosco Wallis. Right, so what are the steps of Frosco Wallis test? So for every test, you have to uh, take note on the steps. So because those are the things that you have to uh, perform in your workout. Okay. So the first step is always the same, that is to set the hypothesis, now an alternative hypothesis. So now we have, let's say we have three samples, okay, three samples, yeah? and then let's say we name the samples as uh, A, B, and C. Okay, it could be more than three. Okay, I just give an example of three samples. So how are we gonna set the hypothesis for, uh, the null hypothesis for this case? Before this, you for the man with me test or even the test before, because we are only having two tests and uh, two samples. So we always say that uh, the null hypothesis is mu A equal to mu B, right? And for the alternative, we can say that um, mu A not equal to mu B, or if 
we know the condition we can say mu a is greater than mu b or mu a is less than mu b so that is the case for two samples so now you have three samples are you going to write the same uh, way of hypothesis like the previous test Should be same, right? Should be the same. Is it? But now you have three samples. How you so should write we it? have null, alternative one, alternative two. Um, no. If let's say let's say you have to write only one null hypothesis and one uh, alternative hypothesis. We compare the mean and median. What do you mean by mean and median? Yes, we, we still compare the mean and the mean. Uh, normally the mean, yes. But how are we going to write the hypothesis system? That's my question. How are we going to write the hypothesis uh, if we want to analyze uh, sample A, sample B, and sample C? Any ideas? It's very easy, isn't it? Sample. Like have three samples, yeah. Okay. Sample A equal to sample B equal to sample C. Yeah. And if not, alternative hypothesis is they are all not equal to each other. Yes, correct. It's just an extension. You see, it's just an extension. So that's my question. It's so easy actually. Okay, so this one you should write H naught mu A. Whatever is, let's say you, you name it as one, two, three, or if you have the specific name for according to the problem, you have to put the label correctly, okay? But you have to write all the three samples. You cannot just write two like before, okay? So this is the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. If let's say uh, not much information is given, you assume that they are not equal, so you can just write. Uh, not equal to mu b and not equal to mu c. Okay, so that's the way. I mean, the key thing here is you have to include all the three samples. This is the extension of it, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So now we are we are, we are always comparing the mean. Yeah, you are correct. Uh, the one who posted on the chat box. Yeah, we are comparing the mean. This is mean eh? because we are always talking about the mean of the sample because the mean represent the whole data. All right, so that's the first step. Uh, the second step, okay, please remember uh, this, how you want to determine whether you want to write not equal or bigger or less, that depends on the question. Okay, that depends on the question. So that's why you have to understand the problem uh, very carefully. You have to, you have to understand the nature, what, what is actually uh, the problem is all about, the analysis is all about. And the, 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 the problem is not that, so difficult for you to understand, you know, like you just, uh, yeah, you just take note of the things mentioned, the words used. Okay. Um, right. So I think I have talked about it. Yeah. How to, how to uh, determine whether it is uh, just like not equal like this, not equal. This is uh, two tau. Yeah. And if let's say it's greater or less, that is one tau. Okay. The second step is to combine and rank the data. Uh, use tight ranks whenever necessary. I hope that you still remember what is tight rank. Okay, tight rank is when you when you rank and you found out that they are data that are similar, of similar values. So you cannot put, let's say, the rank of the two data should be uh, number four and number five, but because of the data are the same, you cannot put one of them as four and the other as five because both of them are similar, isn't it? So that is where you have to use type ranks. Okay, very, please uh, take note of this. Okay, this is the same, like how you find the type ranks for this test and for the previous test is the same because it's about ranking. It's about um, putting the ranks. Eh? And when you rank the data, it should be from the data you should uh, look from from the lowest data, lowest value to the highest, isn't it? To the highest. Okay, meaning to say that the lowest value you, you rank it as number one, okay, until the highest, okay, until uh, whatever the size of the sample. Okay. 
okay, but it should start with number one. Okay, that is rank. Um, and you have to co uh, combine and rank the data, combine the samples. So it means that all the three samples, now before this, you have two samples, right, for the man with me, and you also have to combine the two samples and rank from the lowest to the highest. But now you have more than two, you have three or maybe four. So you, you should be careful, right? You should be careful sometimes because you might miss out uh, the data yeah? and put the wrong rank because your data is getting bigger and bigger now. So please be careful when you uh, combine and rank the data. And once you are done with that, I suggest please check the rank again, right? You know, at one, once you have finished the ranking, uh, check again whether the ranks is correct or not, whether you have missed some of the uh, points or not okay and then step three is to calculate the sum of ranks and also ni okay so what is si si is the sum of each of the samples i is referring to uh, the sample okay uh, so let's say you have now you have to find meaning to say that in this step you have to find what is um if you have three samples what is uh, the sum of ranks of sample a the sum of ranks of Sample B, the sum of ranks of sample C. Okay, but if you have more than that, you still have to find until you know the, the maximum number of the samples. So the I here is referring to the sample, each sample. So don't get confused and uh, don't get confused with the I. Eh? So NI is the sample size. NI is I is also referring to each of the sample. This one is the sample size. Okay. So the size of the sample, it can be similar, it can be not similar. Okay, so that's why uh, you have to take note on uh, the sample size for each, uh, the size of each sample. Okay, so that is step three. So step four is uh, to calculate the test statistics. So when it is said test statistics, this is referring to every test. So every test has its um parameter eh? like this one this is uh, the parameter for classical wallis test h eh? like in man whitney test we calculate u isn't it uh, so that is the test statistics the the thing that you have to find out for that particular test so in classical wallis test you have to calculate h right so this is the formula for h the formula will be given you don't have, you don't have to worry about memorizing this formula but you have to know what it means and how to use it, okay? For example, like what is N over here? So here, the N doesn't have an I, it doesn't have the I. So it means this is what? The sample size of, of uh, the size of all samples. Okay, let, let, later we have a look how to find the N. Yeah? And then here we have this, um, this expression, right? This expression, so what is this? summation this summation so make sure you know how to use it and sometimes you know how to use it but uh maybe because of the workout is long you might easily do careless mistakes so if you should put like a bracket over here i prefer to put bracket so that you don't miss uh, any of the values yeah for example like here the things over here should be multiply with uh the, the term of 12 divided by n times n plus one okay uh, and how to find this summation what does it mean here so make sure that you know this is si square don't even forget the square so it means that once you got the si in step three so you have to put it in this expression and you have to include the square value the square value and this one is ni for each of the sample. So here and uh, minus three and plus one. Uh, step five. Okay, let's have a look at all the steps first eh, before we go into the example. Uh, step five is to compare h value that we got in step four and this chi square value. Okay, this one looks like x squared, but it is not. It, it it's a bit different actually. It's not really x yeah? this this uh this symbol uh this is what we call chi yeah? chi uh, and because of there is a square so we call this the whole term as chi square 
Okay, but you should know that uh, this this one is actually chi. Okay. So there is a chi square distribution table uh, that you should refer. I've uploaded on Elite, right? So you should refer to that table, the chi square distribution table, uh, in order to find um, to find the chi square values. Okay. So why you need the chi square values? Because you need to compare with the h value that you got in step four. Okay. So compare the h and chi square value. The chi square value is obtained from the chi square distribution table. And uh, later you have to make a decision uh, based on this rule of thumb, right? So this is the condition that you need to refer. So if the H value is greater than the chi square value. Then uh, the decision is to reject the null hypothesis. So this is something that you should remember, right? Uh, so step six is to make the decision. Yeah, I mean, this is accept or reject the null hypothesis. Okay, step six. Okay, now, uh, this test is a bit longer than man Whitney test because of uh, the number of samples is uh, is higher, is more than two. So, what does it mean? Okay, if let's say here, if the decision is to accept null hypothesis, accept the null hypothesis means if let's say we have three samples, the null hypothesis says that um, mu a is equal to mu b equal to mu c, right? The null. So if let's say we accept the null hypothesis, uh, the life will be actually in simpler in this uh, task because you don't have to proceed with the following step. Okay, the reason why, okay, if let's say what happened if you reject the null hypothesis, okay, if you reject the null hypothesis means that you accept um, alternative hypothesis, uh, then you have to figure out something more. It's not just about making decisions saying that there is a difference between sample A, B, and C, but you have to find out where is the difference, where the difference lies. So that's why I said, if let's say you accept null hypothesis, it will be much simpler because you will say that there is no difference between sample A, sample B, and sample C. But if let's say, uh, the situation is the other way around. If you have to accept the alternative hypothesis, meaning to say that the mu A is not equal to mu B, is not equal to mu C. But because of there are three samples, actually you do not know where the difference is. It can be uh, only like mu A is not equal to B, but actually mu A is equal to C. Okay, this situation, it can also make uh, the problem falls under uh, the acceptance of alternative hypothesis. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Do you understand? I'm still huh? understand. confused. Confused? Okay. Let me explain again. Eh? So if let's say uh, you accept now hypothesis you have three samples you don't have problem right means that there's no difference between sample a there's no sample a and b b and c a and c okay now if you are talking about the combination yeah the pairs of comparison you want to compare between a and b a and c and b and c isn't it so these are the possible comparison for three samples. So no difference means, yeah, there's no difference. But if let's say there is a difference, yeah, there is a difference. If let's say you accept the alternative hypothesis, let's say uh, when you analyze the H and you, you know, the compare with the chi-square value, and you have to accept the alternative hypothesis. So the alternative hypothesis says that, um, this one, right? this is what you said in the first step. 
mu a is not equal to mu b and it's not equal to mu c. Um, actually, this expression it can happen if uh, it can happen um, due to several possibilities. Okay, that's that's okay. It can be let's say mu a is not equal to mu, mu b, but mu a is equal to mu c. But because of this, this one pair is not different. It is, it makes the whole situation fall under uh, not equal. Understand? So they are all not equal to each other. So for example, I just I, I just came back from the so. Mu A is 1, Mu B is 2, Mu B is C. I'm sorry, Mu, B, Mu C is 3, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, no, will, there will not be a scenario where Mu A equal to Mu B, but not equal to Mu C, right? No, no, no. Uh, when you say that um, uh, the alternative hypothesis is one, eh? alternative hypothesis, I forgot to... Uh, correct the definition if let's say we have three samples eh? uh, if let's say you have two samples it doesn't it's, it's quite straightforward mu a is not equal to mu b isn't it and that's it uh, okay sorry please forgive me for that i forgot to correct eh? the definition for the alternative hypothesis if you have three samples if you have three samples uh if one of them is not is not uh similar to the other two it is, it is, um, uh, it makes the whole situation under alternative hypothesis. Understand? So if let's say uh, mu A is equal to mu C, but mu A is not equal to mu B. So that situation is already, you have to uh, say that there is a difference in the whole, in the three samples. Understand? Okay, okay, I understand now. Thank okay. you, Doctor. Ah, okay, so if let's say now, uh, up to point step six, eh? if let's say you're based on the H and the chi square, you you found out that you have to accept the alternative hypothesis, means there is a difference in all the means. Okay, there is a difference. But the the next question now, where is the difference? Is it, is it between A and B? Is it between B and C or between A and C? So those are the things that you have to find out uh, after step six. If your decision is to accept now, uh, to accept alternative hypothesis, I hope that's clear. What if all the three sets is equal to each other? Uh, if they are not equal to each other, is yeah, you, you will figure out in, in the following steps, uh, which of the uh, pairs will be, uh, I mean, what is the, the comparison between each pairs? Yeah, there is a situation where actually all the pairs are not equal to each other. Okay, so I'll explain later in step seven until step nine. Okay, I hope that answers. Uh, can we know that by using Bonferrani too? Uh, yes, so step seven until step nine will be uh, considered as what we call Bonferrini inequality procedure, whereby the procedure is to find out where the different lies, where the different exists. Okay. Right, so uh, here, step six. So that's why I put here. So if you accept, um, if you accept null hypothesis, so you don't have to proceed with step seven to nine. Means that after step six, you just jump to step 10, which is to make a conclusion. Okay, conclusion is uh, quite similar to previous tests, whereby you just take back whatever, you know, the hypothesis that, the condition, the conclusion, uh, the condition of the hypothesis that you accept. Okay, now let's have a look at step seven to step nine. Okay, what happened if you accept the alternative hypothesis means that now you have to find out where is the difference uh, of all the three samples, whether it's, um, you know, in which pairs. Okay, so that's why I said just now, if let's say we have three pairs or three, um, three, what, uh, three samples, 
So these are the combination of pairs, combination, combination of pairs to be compact. Okay. Uh, so step seven, uh, so what you have to do, step seven, okay, this one is uh, when you accept the alternative hypothesis, you have to proceed by finding SI. SI, this one should be SI, yeah, SI, SI for every sample. Before that, is that SI? Okay, so uh, you have to find the SI bar. This one we call SI bar. What's the difference between SI and SI bar? SI bar is the, this one is actually the mean, the average. Okay, so before this, you have calculated SI only, right? And in order to find SI bar, you have to divide with the sample size uh, of each sample. So it means if you have three uh, samples, then you have uh, S A bar, S B bar, S C bar. Okay. So that is step seven. Uh, step eight, you have to find this uh, term P I J. Okay. So what's I and J means? So if let's say you have just now uh, three samples, okay, A and the possible of pairs are A and B. A and C, and then B and C, right? So it's covered all. So the the position is not uh, doesn't matter whether like B and C is equal to C and B. So you don't have to uh, worry about the order of the. But there are three pairs of comparison to be compared, right? Okay. So this I J I J is referring to um, the two samples that you are comparing at the same time. Yeah, for example, A and B. So you should find what is the D, A, B. You should write it, you know, uh, according to your problem. D, A, B, what? Okay, so now uh, all the related, um, all the related uh, terms like S, I, S, J, it should now refers to S, A bar minus S, B bar. Okay, and then this is another absolute value of that and then the square root of uh, the whole thing over here but you should know that this ni is referring to n a and n j is referring to n b okay so that is the uh, the value d a b d uh, the d value for uh, the pair the a b pair okay and then you have to proceed with the the other pairs as well like d a c with DAC, uh, you have to find what's the value okay, using the same formula, but now you have to refer to different SI uh, bar value and the N, NI or NJ value, okay? And uh, another value is DBC, right? DBC, okay? So you should have three values of uh, D, depending on the, I mean, this one is three because there are three pairs. If you have more than Three samples you should match uh, accordingly. So you should have uh, more than D values. Okay. So that is D, D, I, J, yeah? D, I, J. So don't worry about I, J. I, J is referring to the samples that you are comparing. Okay. Uh, step nine is to find critical value, uh, Z value from normal table. Okay. There is another table that you have to refer. Uh, call normal table or Z table is the same, uh, normal distribution table. Uh, so how are you going to find the critical value? Okay, so first you have to find, this is a step uh, under step 9, 9.1, you have to find this expression, the value of this expression. Uh, this one, this term is equal to this. So we just refer to this part, just refer to this term. Okay, in order to find the rejection region. The rejection region is the cell area. Okay, so how are we going to find that uh, rejection region? So if you see the formula over here, you should know what is the alpha value 
And what is the K? K is the number of samples. So if there, there are three samples, the K is three. And the alpha is sometimes it is stated in the question, sometimes it is not. Yeah? So the normal value is 0 0.05. If it is not stated, you have to know that you have to put, like you have to just uh, state in your workout that you are using alpha equal to 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Either one is fine. The two values are the most uh, common alpha values. Okay. Uh, right. So when you find, let's say, 0 0.05, eh? let's say alpha is 0 0.05, k, let's say 3, and 3 minus 1, okay? So let's say the value of this, uh, how much is this? 3 minus 1, 2, 3 times 2, 6, 9, 0 0.05 divided by 6, yes? uh, 0 0.008. Okay, do you know how to use, do you know about normal distribution table? I'm sure you have studied in SPM, right? I still remember I studied Z distribution in SPM. Did you study it? Yes, okay. Yes. Um. So when you refer to the Z distribution table, okay, let's have a look at it, okay? So you should know first how to use this table. What does the table mean? So we have the Z value, right? the z value and uh, this one is just the decimal points i mean if let's say 0 0.1 and then you refer to this one is uh, 0 0.11 right but what does the value inside here means this one the whole value inside here this is the area isn't it area under the curve okay but how to look for the area you should know the rules Okay, so this is referring to um, referring to the uh, positive or to the right. You can see the, the values, uh, the picture over here. So it's only uh, the, the right side of the table, meaning to say that the area when it is enclosed from zero to whatsoever the Z value, that is the area, okay? for example, like this. Huh? So if let's say this is zero, right? And let's say your Z value, whatever the Z value is up to here. Let's say the Z is uh, 2.62, maybe. Yeah? Let's say the Z is 2.62, okay? So if you refer to the table, if you find from the table when, when the Z is 2.62, uh, the value given is... Uh, 0 0.4956. Yeah, that's actually supposed to be somewhere here. So that is near to 0 0.5. So let's say it is uh, up to here. Okay, Z equal to 2.62. So the value given in the table, uh, which is yeah, 0 0.4956. Okay, 0 0.4956. It, it actually refers to the area under the curve and close from uh, when Z equal to zero until Z equal to 2.62. Okay, that's what it means. I hope you still remember what we have studied before, 4956. Okay, area under the curve. And uh, the maximum or the, uh, the total area is actually, uh, because it's only half, it's, it's actually 0 0.5, isn't it? So that's why if you see the last value in the table is 0 0.499, which is 0 0.5, okay? Uh, why is 0 0.5? Because this is probability, actually. So the total, if you are if you are considering both sides, that will be equal to 0 0.5 times 2, 1. So, then, huh? uh, so you have to know uh, what does the, how to find the area under the curve for the Z table. Okay, now when we talk about uh, tail area, you know, when, when we talk about tail area, it is referring to the tail. It is a tail. This is a tail. This, the, the tail of the distribution. So the whole thing here is called distribution. Distribution. And uh, when we describe the distribution, there are terms that we call uh, tail. The tail, the 
you know, the echo, echo, tell. So this is tell. Yeah? So uh, rejection region, this is something that you have to, um, to accept. Like, I do not know also why sometimes they create rejection as a tell, but perhaps that is actually the, the minus part of the distribution. Okay, uh, so this is the rejection area or region is equal to the tell area. Okay, so now when we go back to the the things that we found out from uh, the step nine just now, right? So let's say you found out that the rejection region is equal to 0 0.003. Okay, so how are you doing to find the Z value from the table using this information? Okay, go back to the table. Uh, 0 0.0083 is referring to this area. Um, this one, 0 0.0083, okay? And how you want to know, how you want to find the set value? Because now uh, your objective in step nine, if you see back step nine, you have to find the Z value. Find Z value that correspond to the tell area. Okay, that is the, the objective of using the Z distribution table. Okay, so you have the information of the tell area. And you know that the total area of one side is 0 0.5. Okay. And you know that the Z value, if you want to find the Z value, it should be from um, the zero axis just now. Yeah. Because uh, as I mentioned, how to find the area under the curve, what the, the area under, under the curve for the Z uh, means, right? Okay. So it means that you have to do something before you can find the Z uh, value. Do you know how, how you want to find the set value? Press on the tell area, the information of the tell area. And you know that uh, you should know that the total area of one side is 0 0.5. So that is uh, not given in the question or uh, you are expected to know by yourself that the total area is 0 0.5. So how to find the set value? Okay, let's let me draw it again. So now this is the tell area, which is 0 0.0083. And this is a zero. Yeah. So this is actually the Z value, the Z value that you are looking for. Okay. So we know that the total area here is 0 0.5. And in order to find the Z value, you have to find actually the area for this region. For this, let's say, uh, I put it like uh, maybe X region. You cannot use in 0 0.0083 from, I mean, you cannot look for 0 0.0083 from the table. So the X is equal to what? Hello? What is the X value? Can someone give me? 0 0.4917. 0 0.4917. 4917. Is this? So, uh, 0 0.25 minus 0 0.0083. Yes, 4917. Okay, so this one should be. 0 0.4917. I hope you know how to find it. Yeah, we know the total area is 0 0.5. Uh, minus the tell area, you should get the X area. Why you need to get the X area? Because you want to find the Z value. Okay, now you know that this one is uh, 4917, right? Okay, so how are you going to find the Z value? The values inside is the area. You have to go from inside to outside. What I mean by in, from from uh, what I mean by from inside to outside is that 0, uh, 0 0.4917 you have to find where it is. Or maybe if you cannot find uh, exactly the value, you should get you should find the nearest value. Okay, for example, it's actually between this actually. 
zero point four nine one six and this one, right? If you can see from the table, because there's no four nine one seven. Uh, so you can actually use two point three nine or two point four zero. Well, actually, it's two point four zero because if you round out, okay. So see, if let's say here, the value of Z that is given by that uh, region, it should be between uh, 2.39 to 2.40. Okay, but uh, normally we round up, eh? we round up, let's say, because it's actually, it will fall into, I mean, 2.39, if you run up also, it will be 2.4. So, you just take the value of 2.4. Okay, that's that's the Z value that you get from uh, uh, from the tail area given. Okay, got it? Any question still on this? You should you should uh, understand this part carefully yeah? because this will give you the Z value over here. Okay. So once you get the Z value, you compare the Z value with each of the DIJ value. Okay, compare DIJ with the critical value. So let's say you have just now a three DIJ value, DAB, DAC, and D, uh, BC. Okay, um, but before that, see this uh, decision rule. If the DIJ is greater than the critical value, which is the Z value, the decision is to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, right? Uh, I don't have the example here. We, we, we're going to look at uh, the detail later, how, what, it, what, it is, what, uh, what is the implication of this comparison. Okay, but this is actually to show that um, for each pair, let's say A and B, A and C, B and C, okay, uh what is the decision if let's say you reject now reject let's say that's on the comparison you found out that you have to reject now reject now or maybe this one accept now so the, it could be uh, the the decision for every pair it could be various but uh it should be uh happen. it should be one of them at least one of them reject the now hypothesis okay so if let's say here, if you see reject now, reject now, and only one accept now, what does it mean? What does it mean here? We have a sample A, B, and C. If we reject the now, it means that we accept the alternative hypothesis, right? Means when we accept the alternative hypothesis, we say that there is a difference. So it means that there is a difference in uh, between uh, sample A and sample B. That is that will that is the thing that you will need to include in your conclusion. A and C reject now means there is a difference. There is a difference between A and C. But B and C, you accept the now means that there is no difference between B and C. Okay. Uh, so uh, this answers uh, your your friend's question just now, right? What was the question you said? When you say that when everything is the same. Uh, what if all the three sets of data is in, uh, unequal to each other? It's not equal to each other. So that will be concluded based on your comparison of DIJ uh, with a critical value, which is the step nine. Okay, from there, you will know that which pair is the same. It can be, I mean, the situation can be different from one problem to another. Maybe in one problem, you have all the pairs are not equal. Uh, so they are not equal, but there could be a situation, another problem that has a pair, one pair that is uh, the same, like in this case, B and C is the same, but A, B and A, C are not the same. Yeah, But the whole situation is considered under alternative hypothesis because uh, one of them is not similar to another. Okay. Um, yeah, so that is step nine. Uh, and this is another decision rule that you have to remember. Okay. And step 10 is to make conclusion. Okay, here is where you have to indicate uh, which pairs that 
have a difference and which peristat do not have a difference. Okay, like for example, if let's say referring to this example, eh, so how I want to uh, write the conclusion uh, at alpha equal to 0 0.05, you have to mention this, this phrase eh, because that is the basis of your analysis. At alpha equal to 0 0.05, uh, sample A and B, as a, to say that, there is a difference. Uh, because A, B, and S you reject now, it means that there is a difference, right? Okay. So there is a difference between uh, sample, you have to mention one by one, eh? sample A and B, and sample A and C. But, there is no difference between sample uh, B and C. Okay, that will be the conclusion. That's on, I mean, this is, I'm referring to the example before. That's how you construct uh, the conclusion. You should indicate which pairs that have a difference, which pairs that do not have a difference. Okay, any question before we go into the example? Oh, I forgot to introduce the table, the chi-square table. Um, that is in step, oh yeah, step five. Eh? So, uh, just go back a little bit, sorry for that. Okay, step four, you have to find the H, right? And step five, you have to compare H and chi-square. So in order for you to compare the H and chi-square, you have to find the chi-square value. So the chi-square value is obtained from chi-square table. Okay, so what are the informations needed? You should uh, know, you should calculate this value, the degree of freedom, we call it, given by, uh, the symbol of degree of freedom is V, is given by K minus one. K is the number of samples. So let's say the, the number of samples is three, so the V is two, okay. So how to use uh, that information and find the chi-square table from, the, to find the chi-square from the table. So this is chi-square distribution table, we call it, yeah. Uh, so you need to know, okay, you need to know the V, this is V, it's not really clear, but uh, you have to look carefully. Okay, this is V and this one is alpha, this alpha. So this, this value is alpha. So alpha is uh, normally 0 0.05, right? Yeah, unless you use 0 0.01, so you have to refer to the right column. So 0 0.05 is given by here. Okay, so K, uh, B is, let's say, uh, just now is K minus one, right? To the three minus one, uh, which is two. So the chi-square value is given as 5.991. Okay, so this is the, chi square value that I am looking for for the problem for the example just now. Okay, so these the values given here are all the chi square value that you are you have to look for for every problem. Okay, so it's quite simple for this double. Um, so you should calculate V and you should know what's the alpha value. Okay. So that chi-square is to be uh, used for comparing the H in step five. Yeah, I forgot to mention just now. Okay, so the decision of, uh, the rule of decision is to reject the null hypothesis if the H is greater than the chi-square. Uh, the K minus one is referring to your problem. I don't worry about this, uh, this, this uh, phrase, huh? this so. Okay. All right. Uh, so if you see the lecture notes, because this one is from uh, the course coordinator, uh, this is slide number 11. Uh, slide number 11 and 12, actually it represents step seven and nine, seven to nine. Okay, so it's actually the same thing. So 
I would not go through here because I have explained to you, right? So it's a repetition a little bit, but I don't want to discard it. Otherwise, if you compare with the friends from other groups, you say that you don't have this part. So, but this is actually the repetition of step seven to nine. Okay. Yeah, it's the same thing, is it? The IT alpha. Okay, let's have a look at the first example over here. Um, so normally you will be given like a problem like this. So if you see there are three samples and they are independent, okay, one of the criteria of independent samples, the sample size is not equal. You can see method one is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, only six. The N1, the N2 is seven. And one is six. And, and two, yeah, and two is seven. And three is five, right? Uh, so one of the um, indicators, uh, the samples are independent. You can see they are not equal in terms of the size. Yeah. So they are not dependent. The dependent always the same. If you if you see the the dependent samples, the size is always the same because they are comparing one point to another point in the other sample. So this, you see there are three samples, they are independent, so obviously you know that you should use Pascal Wallis test. Okay. So sometimes the problem asks you like this, it, does, it doesn't mention the name of the test. So that's why you have to know which test to use by yourself. Uh, but if let's say it is stated in the question, then it's fine enough. But if it's not stated, then you have to know. In this case, we have to we have to use Pascal what is. Okay, so if you use man with then you got wrong answer. Okay, so here eh, the problem is to compare three different methods of teaching German. Students are randomly assigned to one of the three methods and their exam marks are recorded in the table below together with the ranks of the marks. Okay. Another thing is why these data are non-parametric data because the sample size is less than 25, which is six, less than 25. Uh, seven and also uh, five is also less than 25. So this is non-parametric data. So you have to apply non-parametric tests. Okay. And not one way and over. It's one way and over is for the parametric test. Uh, okay, so how are we going to do this? So just apply all the nine steps or all the ten steps that we have discussed before. Okay, step one is to uh, to establish the hypothesis, right? So you see here, uh, the alternative, the the null says that the three means are equal. Or you can also put it in the form of equation, like new, happening new method one. Okay, new one is equal to new two is equal to new three. Okay, if you don't want to, it can be either in words or you can put it in the form of equation like that. Uh, alternative hypothesis. Uh, this is what I meant just now. At least one of the means is different from the others. At least one of the means is different from the others. That is alternative hypothesis. Or you can also say that can be mu one, you know, it's not equal to mu two, or it's not equal to mu three. Also can be written as like that. Okay, so the second step is to uh rank, to combine and rank the data. What is meant by combine the data? Means you consider all the data. Uh, you rank from the first to the lowest. Uh, from from the lowest to the highest. Okay, so when you combine all the data, means you consider all. Yeah. So, uh, the one in the bracket is the ranks. Uh, it's given to you here. Okay, the original data is the one outside the bracket. Uh, so if you analyze the data, let's have a look at the original data over here. Right, the original data. So. You combine means that you, yeah, you just mix them all when you put the ranks. Um, so the lowest value is given by what, this one, right? 61, isn't it? The lowest. So you have to examine carefully yeah, when you analyze it because sometimes you might miss the lowest one and you might rank the whole thing incorrectly. 
and the highest value is uh, 97. This is the highest, isn't it? So maybe you can just write, I mean, when you do your analysis, eh? highest. Okay, so you start your ranking from 61, we put it as number one, followed by, what's that? 61, 67, isn't it? 67, number two, number two, okay, and so on. Okay, that's how you make it, right? Now, um, if you see how to know whether you should put tight ranks or not, okay, when you analyze the data, is there any similar values? Is there any similar values? What I mean by similar values, like 72 and 72? Is there any more? Um, any more? Did you notice? No more, right? So that's the only one. Okay. So you start ranking like one, uh, 61 as one, 67 as two, and then 69, is it the third one? Number three. Number three. You can follow me, right? I hope you understand what I'm doing now. Number three is 69. Okay. What else? Number four is what? Fourth rank. 72. Oh, 72. Yeah. Okay. So now you can see. Uh, is it correct? Okay. So now you should actually rank these two, these two values supposed to, uh, to be ranked as number four and number five, isn't it? If let's say following the normal order, the normal uh, ranks. So, but you cannot, this is what I mean. Uh, this is what I said just now. You cannot assign number four and number five because both of the values are similar. So, uh, because of the rank now is four and five, so in order to find the tight rank, yeah, so it's a tight rank is equal to the current ranks of the values, which is four and five divided by two, that is four point five, isn't it? Okay, so uh, these two values should be ranked as four point five, four point five. Okay, so that is tight rank. This is tight rank. Okay, so the next rank should be six. You cannot use five anymore. You cannot use uh, four or a five. Okay. You should proceed with six. Okay, the next value after 72 is 74, isn't it? Yeah, so this should be six. The rank, yeah? Six and then seven, 76. Um, eight, and so on until you finish. Okay, I expect you know how to rank it. So I just want to show the type rank just now. Okay, so this is the uh, ranks, the correct ranks, yeah, the one that I highlighted over here. I'm supposed to get it. This one. Okay. Uh, so that is meant by combining and rank the data. You combine all the data and rank them. Okay, step three is to find the sum of ranks. So what is meant by sum of ranks? Okay, now you have the sum of ranks for every sample. Yeah, let's say method one, you have all the numbers in the bracket over here. So the sum is, you just sum it. Don't, don't sum the data, you have to sum the, the ranks. This is rank. This is rank. So sum of, uh, in, some of the common mistakes uh, I noticed last semester, uh, maybe you mix up, I mean, some of, some of the students mix up, they sum the data. So instead of summing 17 plus 14 plus 16 until 18, they sum 94 plus 88 plus 91 plus uh, 74. I mean, yeah, the data of the sample, which is wrong, okay? So please make sure that you take the right value. So that's why you have to level, um, level, Nicely, the ranks, eh? 
maybe you differentiate it with the actual data in order to avoid the confusion. Because uh, in the test, maybe you are, you know, you are you are rushing and then you see the wrong values and you find the wrong sum values. Okay. So uh, you have to find the ranks, the sum of the ranks. So that's why it's called the sum of the ranks. It's not the sum of the data. Okay, you should get uh, the value for each sample, like this one, okay, and this one. So that is step three. And also you have to identify NI. NI is the sample size, the size of each sample. So let's say N1 is how many data are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. So N1 is six. N2 is um and two is seven yeah. and three is five yeah. so this is the things that you have to figure out as well yeah s1 uh, si and also and i okay so that is step three step four is to find the h okay so the h is given as uh you know the formula is given just now so you have to apply uh the formula and substitute the values. And the values needed are S, I, and N, I. So that's why you have to find it in step three. So you just plug in the value into the formula. Okay, don't forget the square over here. There is square. Okay. Um, yeah, so the H value in this problem is given as 6.67. Okay, that is step four. Yeah, step four. Uh, step five is to find the chi-square value because you need to compare with the h value. First, you have to find the chi-square value. Okay, is it given in the question, the alpha value? Let's see. No, it's not given. Okay. Uh, the, the original problem does not indicate the alpha value, so you have to define by yourself 0 0.05. Okay, so... In step five, when you want to find the chi-square value, you have to put this um, statement using, using alpha equal to 0 0.05 so that I know that you are referring to 0 0.05. If you are using alpha equal to 0 0.01, also you have to state so that I know your values is based on that. So uh, the answer from my side, it should be, there, there should be two versions. One is when the alpha is 0 0.01 and another one is when alpha equal to 0 0.05. It doesn't matter, but you have to state the uh, the basis, okay? So uh, what you have to okay, let's say let's find the value of the chi square from the uh, chi square distribution table, okay? So what's the information that you need? The alpha zero point zero five, and the v because there are how many samples? Three, right? So v equal to k minus one. Remember the formula of degree of freedom. This is this is degree of freedom. Remember, degree of freedom. The symbol is v. Uh, it is equal to k minus one. K is the number of samples. So, uh, in the samples, in the example just now, the k is three. So k minus one is two. So the value that you are looking for is five point nine nine one. So that is the chi square value for this problem. Okay, let's go back to the problem. Uh, yeah, so that's how you got the 5.991. Then uh, we compare the H and the H and the chi square value, right? So this is the one that needs to be compared. And since uh, the H is greater than the chi square, so we reject the null hypothesis. Yeah? This is based on the rule of decision. Yeah, go back to the to the slides before, you can see the rule of decision is to reject the null if the h is greater than the chi-square. Okay, so reject the null, what does it mean? It means you accept the alternative. Accept alternative. And it means that there should be a difference in, uh, in the three methods, at least in one of the methods. Yeah, so means that here you have to proceed with step seven to step nine, which is Bonferrini inequality procedure. The name the name of the step is 
uh, is uh, termed as Bonferrini inequality procedure, step seven to step nine. Okay. So what you have to do is you proceed with step seven. Uh, what you have to find out from step seven is the value of the SI bar or the, the average of the SI. Okay. So you have calculated the SI value in the previous step. Okay, just use the value like this one, 84, 55.5, and 31.5. These are calculated in step three, I guess, before. Okay, so how to find the average is you divide by the sample size. So for S1, 84 divided by 6, that's 14. S2 is uh, 55 divide, 55.5 divided by 7, 7.93, and S3, 31.5 divided by 5, we got 6.3. Okay, we should get uh, the average value for all the samples. Okay, so what's next? Uh, we have to calculate the DIJ. The step eight says that you have to calculate the DIJ. Okay, now you have three samples, so you have to uh, create the pairs. So it means that the pairs now should be between uh, one and two. One and this is sample. This is possible uh, pairs of comparison. Yeah. One and three and two and three. Right, so it means that now when you want to look for DIJ, DIJ is referring to every pair. So you have to calculate what is D12, what is D13, and what is D23. Okay, so you just plot in the values, yeah, the SI, the S1, S2 bar yeah, into each of this formula, and also the, the NI and J referring to which pair or which samples you are comparing. Okay, another thing that you have to take note over here is uh, this symbol, the absolute value, right? So whatever that comes out, whatever that is negative inside that uh, term, it should be written as positive values, meaning to say that you shouldn't get negative values of DI shouldn't be negative values because of that, uh, you know, that uh, symbol, the bar, yeah? So if you got negative values, please check, or maybe you forgot to, uh, to take the absolute value, okay? So if you got negative value, it's wrong, okay? So once you get these values, why it is very important? Because if let's say you have negative values, because you are going to compare this DIJ with the with the Z value in the next step. So what happens if let's say you have negative, you, you wrongly uh, write a negative, uh, let's say you put negative 0 0.52. When you compare with the Z value, of course it is less than that. So it will give you wrong decision. Yeah? So that's why it's very important at this stage, to acknowledge that DIJ shouldn't be negative values. Okay, right. The next step, okay, I expect you to know how to use the formula because it's just about plugging in, yeah? And also you have to careful with the terms, eh? the bracket, uh, the square root as well. Uh, sometimes the students forgot to find the square root values. It's just like we write 8.82 instead of the square root of 8.82. So you got the wrong DI value at the end. Okay, it's, it's all about mathematics at that point, actually. Okay, step nine is to find the critical value. But how to find the critical value is actually the Z value, remember? But how to find the Z value? You have to find the rejection region. So the rejection region is given by the formula that I mentioned earlier. Okay, let's have a look at uh, the steps. Rejection region, what's the formula? Alpha, okay, alpha divided by K, K minus one. This one, no? This, this one. This rejection region. Okay. 
Okay, this formula is the one that you have to apply in order to find the tail area. Okay, so we'll go back to the steps. Okay. Uh, so write, write back the formula, the rejection region equal to alpha k, k minus one. Okay. Uh, alpha, let's say you assume in this case is uh, is given zero point uh, ten percent. So you can also use other values actually. The most common is zero point zero five and zero point zero one. This one should be zero point one. It doesn't matter actually the alpha, but as long as it is in the table, and you state it, okay. In this um workout, the answer is given based on alpha equal to ten percent. Okay, let's say use ten percent. Eh? So the when you convert it, ten percent is equal to zero point one. Okay, zero point one k is equal to three. Remember the number of samples, and three minus one is two. Okay, so the rejection region now is uh, given as this value, 0 0.0167. Okay, so that is the tail area. So you sketch your Z distribution. It's, it's, it's very good to sketch because then you can imagine where it is and you can uh, visualize what you have to find out. Okay, so this one is the tail area. It's given by 0 0.1. Six seven, yeah, or rejection region. This is cell area or rejection region. So you know it's the 0 0.0167, and you have to find what's the site value at that point. So you have to find what's this area first, right? So this one is equal to 0 0.5 minus 0 0.0167 which is equal to uh, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.0167. 0 0.4833. Okay, correct. Thanks. 0 0.4833. This is not yet the critical value. Uh, don't get confused. Eh? This is the area under the curve. You have to find the Z. The Z is the critical value. So referring to the table, uh, the Z table, 0 0.4833, where it is. It's somewhere here, isn't it? But that's the nearest one, 0 0.4834. So this one. Uh, so you have to look for the Z value of that, which is 2.13. Okay. The way how you uh, you read the Z is you go to the yeah, you go to the first column first, and then go, after that you go to the uh to the row above. Okay, so the answer is 2.13, the Z value. Right? So you write. Yeah, that's how you got 2.13. Okay, so that is the value that you need to compare uh, for every pairs. Yeah? Remember the DIJ that you have calculated before? Uh, these are the values, right? And these are the values that you have to compare with the Z 2.13. Okay, let's say D12, 2.04 is less than 2.13. So the decision is to accept the null. Because you only you reject the now if it is greater, right? So the other way around, it, the situation is opposite. Huh? So these are the decision for every pair. Okay, decision, not yet conclusion. So when you write the conclusion, you have to put it specific. Means uh, you should write it at okay. This is the conclusion at alpha equal to whatever the value that you use. Let's say in this case is ten percent. Um, so you have to know that like except now means that there is no difference between sample A and sample, uh, sample one and sample two. But this is what actually the decision, what the decision means. Yeah. Reject now means you accept the alternative hypothesis. 
alternative aptitude says that there is a difference. So there is a difference between, uh, in this case, it's method, right? Method one and method three. Okay. And for the, the last pair, uh, method two and method three, you accept now means you, uh, there is no difference. There is no difference between method two and method three. So those are the things that you should write in your conclusion. Yeah? So in your conclusion, at alpha equal to 10%, method one is different from method three. Okay, which is actually this one. But there is no difference between method one and two and also method two and three. Okay. So this is optional. Uh, this is optional, I guess. This is not really. Yeah, because this is about uh, score, I guess. So since uh, the rank is larger, so that's why it's. But you don't have to uh, see better or worse unless the question asks you. But if let's say it doesn't mention, it actually uh, concerns with whether there is a difference or not between the pairs that you are comparing. Okay, so up to here also I can accept. Okay, is it clear? It's quite lengthy this time around uh, compared to uh, man with me test. Uh, but if you practice a lot, then you will not be. Confused. I mean, you know what to do. Okay. Any question? Anything that you don't understand? What the IJ means? What uh, IJ is referring to the pairs of comparison. Uh, the things that you are comparing at that point. Uh, like one and two, it should be I. I should be one. one two is J. Okay. It's just a uh, a general symbol, so uh, I and J. Okay, so what happened if let's say uh, you found out that at six step eh, when you analyze the H and you analyze the chi square and you accept the null hypothesis, the decision is to accept the null hypothesis at six point over here. Means that you don't have to proceed with step seven until nine. Make sense? Because there is no difference, everything is the same. Yeah, so there is no point for you to find where's the difference because it will not happen then. So in that case, you should just stop at step six and jump to conclusion, saying that there is no difference between uh, sample A or sample one, two, and three. But still, you have to make a conclusion because uh, conclusion is is compulsory for uh, either case. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it. Uh, the cross code world is test. Okay. It has 10 steps and it is for analyzing three and uh, more than two, not just three, uh, more than two independent samples. Okay. Independent samples. So that's how it differs from man with me test. Man with me test is only for analyzing two independent samples. Okay. So I hope that you understand what I have explained. Okay, there are two exercises for you to do at home. Uh, exercise one and exercise two. Okay, let me cap. Yeah, I think I've covered it all. Yeah. So um, let's do the exercises and I will create a section uh, on Elite for you to give the final answer for the exercise one and exercise two so that I know that you practice and that will be considered as your attendance for today. So I will not take the attendance uh, using the QR code as usual. Okay, so at least you benefit something, you learn, you do the exercise and you know that shows that you have understood what I have lectured today. I think that's more meaningful. And it's part of your preparation for the mid semester exam as well. This is just around the corner. It's, today is 19 April. How many days left? Two weeks. So please do a lot of practices. Uh, find the exercises from the internet. Okay. If you have any question, you can just email me at any time. And also, um, before we finish, I've also uploaded. Um, if you check 
the elite. Huh? I just uh, updated. Uh, there is a video tutorial for every test, a uh, previous test that we have covered. Yeah, let's say for sign test, there is a video tutorial. So this video tutorial is uh, a tutorial that uh, guide you how to solve the problem uh, for this test. Okay, so it's it's actually a YouTube uh, tutorial that I prepared before. Yeah, so have a look at those tutorials. Okay, so it um, yeah it guides you with all the steps that you need to do for every test. Okay, inshallah for Pascal Wallis, I would upload the video tutorial. I have yet to prepare it. Uh, hopefully by end of this week. Okay. Uh, so anything you just check in this time for any references or things that I put over here. Okay, this one I have yet to update it. I will put like quiz one for example uh, for exercise one and quiz two for exercise two. So later you just uh, put the answer there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and attendance. Any question you want to ask? Anything unclear about Crosco Wallis or any test before? Uh, excuse me, doctor. Yes. For the data for exercise one in the slide, how do you determine if the data is dependent or not if there is only day one and day two? Because it's day, so is, is there like, yeah, how, how do we just determine if it's dependent or not? Thank you, doctor. Whether they are dependent or not. Um, the data in the table below gives the efficiency of a chemical process using, using three different catalysts on each of four days. Okay, let me guide you a little bit. Um, if you see back now, yeah, it's... Okay, so the question asks, the data in the table below gives the efficiency of a chemical process using three different catalysts, A, B, and C, on each of four days. So those are the data. Is there evidence that the different catalysts result in different efficiencies? Okay, now, uh, you might be wondering whether you want to compare between day or between catalysts. Uh, so, because you can also compare from uh, between day one, day two, day three, and day four, right? And also, uh, in terms of uh, using catalysts, I mean, from catalyst point of view, between catalyst A, catalyst B, and catalyst C. So, you have to refer to the question. To the question. So, what the question asks? The question says that you have to come, you have to, I mean, the question focuses on catalyst. So, right? So this is actually this is actually the samples, the samples, and not the day. Okay, so you would encounter this uh, uh quite often after this because you have to differentiate which one is which is the which is the sample which is the which one is the sample that you want to compare. Okay, uh, right. Your sorry, your question just now is that determine if the data is dependent or not. Is that your question? Yeah, correct, Doctor. So it's three different catalysts, so it's independent, is it? Yeah, independent. So normally dependent samples. Um, so if you say if you see there are more than two, uh they are more likely to be independent. Okay, so in this case, if you see that there are three samples, right? Uh Although the size is the same, like in this case, the size is the same, but 
they are independent uh, because normally, uh, as I said just now, dependent, it relates to uh, only two samples or two data sets, right? So obviously we know that that are dependent, uh, but if you have more than two, they are more likely independent. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Doctor. Okay. Uh, same for the question uh, exercise two. Okay. So, how do you want to know whether you are comparing tree between trees or between days? Okay. So, you have to refer back to the question. The fungi species richness uh, was measured on a 10 point scale on four different species of trees over a period of four days, and the results tabulated as below. Okay. Uh, perform a cross wallace test to investigate whether there is a difference, significant difference in fungi species richness between the trees. Take the measurement on different days as being replicate measurements. Okay, so you, you can see the focus is actually um, revolved around the trees. That is actually the, the point of comparison, not the day. The day are just the replicate days, the different days as the replicate measurement. Okay, don't get confused. Huh? The days as so that's why I said uh, when you come across any question, you have to understand the problem. You have to understand what is the things to be compared. Uh, so you don't just analyze directly. If, if I don't if I don't read the things mentioned carefully, I would just or maybe I would just analyze between days. You know, you know what I mean? Because like this case, it might not be that really critical. Let's say the end would be the same. But if let's say what happened if, um, you know, in some examples, uh, it could be like four trees, but then up to three days, uh, that will be a problem because um, the, yeah, yeah, to make it simple, uh, you have to identify the samples correctly. Okay. I don't want to complicate the situation. Okay. So these trees, like this one, these are the samples. So these are the samples. So it means that your K is three, not four. Okay. So this one, I thought K is four. K is. Okay, that's the first thing that I that I forgot to mention in the beginning. The first thing that you have to identify in any problem the what is the samples okay i think that's it for today thank you for your attention it's already like the two hours maybe i'm tired I'm sorry for having no break forgot to have a break okay so uh yeah just uh submit your answers in um, elite later yeah i'll create the section for exercise one and exercise two uh and you're free to submit the answers for until Friday, yeah, I keep it until Friday. Hey, there's other question. Is it wrong if we misuse man weighting test on a pair of related data because it's hard to tell if the two data is related or not? Mm. Uh, okay, from the question, it will say, uh, also it will mention the word sometimes uh, randomly. So there are key points randomly, and you can also see whether, um, whether or not the sample size is equal, if sometimes it's not also, sometimes you have to analyze, you have to actually understand the problem. Lah. So if let's say it's about like before and after, obviously it's dependent, okay? And if let's say it's about um, related to one sample, but you know, two different situation is, that is another dependent type of data, okay? What else? If we look back to example one, <clears throat> in Wilkinson test, why the two data need to be as dependent? Wilkinson test. Wilkinson test. Yeah? Okay, let's have a look at Wilkinson.
Which example we can say? Example one. Something. Example one. Okay. Uh. Eight properties are accessed by two registered evaluators. The problem is to find out whether evaluator X gives higher evaluation than evaluator Y. The evaluations are given in the following table. Okay, like this one is because um, it is stated property, like property one to eight, and it is given um, the points for that particular uh, thing. For example, eh, uh, evaluator X and evaluator Y, they compare property one and we have to compare it. Okay. Compared to like random uh, data, like uh, the one that we see for this one, okay, Japan. Okay, like and we go back to I have to stop sharing. Okay, like this one, as I said just now, uh, uh, it refers to the property of, uh, this is actually the point of comparison like they want to see what how each of the point differs from uh evaluator x and evaluator y okay right so if you see this one if you see what's going on If you see um, the random samples, okay. okay. So if you see this question, one of the indicators is the word randomly assigned. Okay. Randomly assigned means that you're just comparing the whole thing. Uh, you don't care about, there is no thing that you want to match from sample one to sample two and three. See, you see this one, even the size is not equal, right? And there is nothing that you want to compare uh, to assign for the comparison. That's what I can say, okay? Uh, randomly assigned, and you can see the, the way how the data looks like. Uh, that, is a, that is a difference uh, between one of the differences between uh, dependent and independent samples. Okay. All right, so I will give some examples, maybe uh, just to uh, familiarize yourself with the types of data, some exercises maybe. Uh, right, I will post it maybe on Eli. Okay, right. Okay, that's it for today. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so your responses for the exercises will be considered as uh, your attendance. Okay. All right. So have a nice day, everyone. Take care. Okay.
Okay, Doctor. Okay. Okay, Doctor. All right, welcome. 